Good morning. Bit of a uh, bit more driving music there for for fans of the Eagles. Um, good morning. Welcome. So today I'm going to be talking about motorhome trips. If you managed to catch my other video when I talked specifically about our motorhome trip in April, which is to Arizona, that's a real walkthrough of a detailed walkthrough of our specific itinerary, which is suitable for motorhomes, but also you could do it, um, you know, as part of another trip you know, go back and watch that. I will reference it a little bit today, but not um, in massive detail. So if you're interested in that, go back and look at that. Um, I will try and um, uh, post a link in the comments. Um, if you can't find it, just tag me and I'll and I'll uh, link you to it. So today I'm going to talk about motorhomes. I'm going to specifically talk about why you should motorhome, how you motorhome, where you motorhome, where you stay, where you can visit, and just um, a few more details. There is endless amount of information that I could give you about this topic, and I'm only going to be able to scratch the surface today, even though you know I've got quite a lot of material already planned. But if there's something that I haven't covered that you want to know, please let me know. This is being hosted by StreamYard, which means that um, if you comment, uh, I may not necessarily be able to see your name unless you give StreamYard permission. But please do comment if you're watching, say hello, you know, ask me a question, happy to, to deal with those. And if you're watching it on replay, the same, you know, if you've got any comments or questions, just write in the, write in the comments and I will answer them. So let's sort of start and, and have a walk through about motorhome trips. So let me gonna share my screen. It's not much use if you can't see it. There we go. Okay. Why motorhome in? So we motorhome in the UK. We have um, a small motorhome or RV in as they call it in America. We are very used to that kind of camper van lifestyle. We love it. And now we're gonna take that to um, America or Canada and have that same sort of holiday there and there are lots of reasons why it's brilliant and these are just some of them one of my favorites is that you only have to unpack once it's also the reason i love cruising this is for the same reason you know, you you get all your things you take everything out you prepare and plan and then that is your home for the rest of your holiday so whether that's a week or two weeks or whatever you're you're all in the same place and you don't have to keep moving from place to place i love road trips and i love moving from distant different destinations to different destinations but unpacking and repacking for six seven eight nine hotels can be quite tiring by the end so that's why i think motorhoming will be a, a perfect opportunity to do something similar but without those negatives you can stop wherever you want. I love this. We love this in this country. We don't kind of have to think, oh, where are we going to have food? Where is it a toilet for the little one? You know, all those sorts of things. You can just drive and stop where you want. You can drive for an hour and have a break, stop over, you know, by a lovely pull in. You can you know, stay for a few hours somewhere and you know you've got facilities to make food, go to the toilet, somewhere to rest. So you can just pace yourself much better and because you've got all those facilities with you all the time and you, you don't have to worry particularly in these times you know is the shop open is the restroom open is the restaurant open can we get things we need because you have everything with you so from that point of view um i really like that they are self-contained which i've kind of just explained and also socially distanced so if you if you're still feeling a bit nervous about the thought of going on holiday obviously you have to fly for a short amount of time with a large number of people but Many people are saying they don't want to go places where they feel very crowded, hotels which are really packed or resorts where there's lots of people. Well, the great thing about motorhome is you can kind of go out into the public as much as you want or as little as you want. And if you only want to pop to the supermarket and get your things and spend the rest of the time exploring on your own. If you go into the USA and Canada, there are so many wide open spaces you could you know you could choose never to see another person for the whole of your trip if you wanted to it is up to you how much interaction you have with other people but you don't need to have a lot of interaction because you will have you know a lot of what you need you can change your itinerary which i really like a lot of the time people will have a set itinerary but if you decide you know when you're there actually there's some I don't know, there's roadworks or there's something happening that means we can't go to this place or we don't want to go to this place or it's very busy or there's a, a, a sort of a, a, an event going on that we want to go to or an event that we want to avoid. You can change your itinerary. And we'll talk a little bit about campsites later on. And lots of bookings are fairly flexible. So even if you've made a campsite booking, you can often change them without too much difficulty. I think it's quite cost effective because the cost of a flight and a motorhome 
especially if you've got more than two people, is generally going to be less than the cost of flights and accommodation. If you've got a larger family, say you've got three children, you're having to maybe have two hotel rooms or a larger hotel room, the cost can start to mount up. So I think having a, a motorhome is, you know, cost effective. You can also do a number of sort of self-catering. You can cook breakfast for yourself. You can cook your tea. You don't, I mean, lots of people like to eat out as part of their holiday and that's what they enjoy, but you don't have to particularly with kids, buying snacks is infinitely expensive. And if you have a hotel room that doesn't have a fridge or somewhere for you to store snacks, you're constantly buying things because they're saying, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. So, you know, it's great to be able to carry things with you like that. You can go to a local supermarket, buy things in bulk, and, and that can help it be more cost effective. RV in motorhome, it helps you get closer to the things you want to see. A lot of times you can stay in a campground in a national park where there isn't necessarily a hotel. So if you were staying on a road trip with a car, you may not be able to get as close to the action. Again, and we'll talk a little bit more about camping and you can do wild camping. You can park and camp right in the middle of some incredible locations that in this country would probably be labelled some sort of, you know, national monument. But, but there's so many that, you know, they're just um, every direction. There's something amazing and you can you can camp in amongst all of those things or in campsites that are already in amazing locations. So I think you get closer more of an experience and because you can stay late because you have all your own things with you you maybe not necessarily feel you need to leave a place as early or you can get somewhere really early in the morning and you know maybe have a little bit of a lie down and a, and, and go back to sleep for half an hour before you get up to see the sunrise or whatever whatever suits you you can go at your own pace I've sort of spoken a little bit about that already, but I think it's really important to kind of reinforce that you get to choose your holiday even if um, even if you've booked campsites and things, you can still decide how fast or slow you want to go. And that kind of applies to road trips in general. But I just think the flexibility is so much greater with a motorhome. So moving on, which motorhome is right for you? We've booked our motorhome holiday with Cruise America or we've booked it with a supplier that uses Cruise America. They aren't the only RV company in America, but they are the biggest and most of the suppliers use them. The reason they're popular is because they have three different they have four different sizes of units, but the one is so small that I probably wouldn't recommend it for people who are going for more than a couple of days. So they have three main units and they are um, very specifically catered for people who are not necessarily used to motorhome in. They have everything you need, but no fancy extras that are just going to get in the way, confuse you or, you know, become um easily break and things like that so they're really well suited for first time motorhome users and also for people who want to kind of move you know go go somewhere where they haven't um maybe driven motorhome before and things like that so they have three sizes you can see them here so there's this um the sort of compact size they say the compact size. this is the size of our motorhome which we think is quite big so they have compact size standard size large size and i'm going to talk about each one in detail so you can get a bit of an understanding about what the motorhome has inside to work out which one is right for you in this country i would always say go small because the smaller you have the more um spaces you can fit in the more places you can go it's a lot more convenient it doesn't really apply in America. The roads are massive, they're wide, their car parking spaces are huge. They understand that people have big vehicles. Most car parks will have spaces for RVs. There's very few places, unless you're driving like, in a city, where the size of the vehicle is gonna be a massive issue. Obviously, you have to feel comfortable driving it, so you need to think about that as well. But I wouldn't certainly worry about the first two sizes, so these two sizes, in terms of being able to fit them in you know, almost anywhere. So let's have a little look. So the compact motorhome is aimed for three people. I would say ideally only do this if you are a couple. It's um, you can see sort of the the day. Th this is the daytime view. This is the nighttime view. Sorry, I'm skewing it a little bit. Um, you can see that the bed in all of these there is a bed that is above the cab we have this in our motorhome it's very very comfortable it's actually quite a big bed in these motorhomes it's large it's like a large king size bed not quite like a super king but i would say probably yeah, at least a king size and um, they're not necessarily standard sizes but that sort of size um and it's not you might think it's claustrophobic it really isn't there's quite a lot of space um there for you to kind of get in and it easily holds two adults so that's mainly where the that's mainly where the bed is and then if you have a, like a small child or a small adult they would go on the 
the, the dining room table here, you can see it converts into a bed. And this contains a bathroom, so it's got a shower and a toilet. It's got a um, kitchen, a fridge, a microwave, and the microwave is also an oven, like a, a like a convection oven, small oven. Um, and it, it, when when every, when the bed's away, you've got sort of the bench seat in and then um, a couple of little seats or one seat really this year. So I would say if you're a couple and you're going for today a week, this would be ideal. Anything more than that, I would say probably move up to the next one. So this is the one that we're getting, the standard motorhome. Similar, but it's got like an extra bit on the back. So you've got the over the bed cab, over the cab bed again. And then also the table can transform down. But in addition to that, you also have a fixed bed at the back. It's not quite as big as the bed um, over the cab, but it is a, um, a decent size you know, for two people. And you also have a shower and a toilet, but then the sink is like slightly separate. You have some storage. They've got pretty decent fridges. American fridges are huge, but these are um, you know, not hugely dissimilar to what you'd have in a UK fridge. So really good size fridge. Again, microwave, hob, sink all the things you need. I think, you know, if you're going with more than two people and you're going for more than a week, this is the one you should take. In terms of driving, you know, they're really easy to drive. They have rear sensors, they've got big mirrors, the roads are wide, you know, unless you are a very, very nervous driver, I think you'd be fine driving anything up to this one. And then this will sleep. So I would say this sleeps up to five. Um, I think it technically says six, but I really wouldn't want to squeeze more than five people in here. The large motorhome then will sleep up to seven. So in addition to the beds that we've already described, you've got cab bed, table bed, there's a, there's a fold down bed here, and then there's also a big fixed bed at the back. So you have a bit more extra space. It's longer, it's a bit more of a bedroom at the back, which is actually more sort of self-contained as opposed to the other one, which is like in the main body of the cab. So you, um, yeah, you do have a bit more space, but what you are getting in this is a bit more, um, a bit more tricky to drive. You know, it's a longer vehicle. You are probably gonna have to take a little bit more consideration about where you go with this one. So perfect for a larger family, but just bear in mind some of the logistics. Things you need to know about motorhome in. So questions that people often ask, you can do one-way trips, that's fine. There is a one-way fee, but actually in comparison with maybe doing a return journey, even with the cost of fuel, it probably isn't that much difference. There, or the cost of flying back to your original point or whatever, you know, one-way trips um, are very possible and, and can easily be sorted out. If you're coming from the UK to America or Canada, you have to stay in a hotel one night before. So if you want to do a 14 night journey, you have to fly in for 15 nights. They don't want anybody doing a 10, 12, however long hour flight and then driving an RV for the first time on the wrong side of the road. So you do need to stay one night in a hotel, however you book, however you book your RV. Now, there's several things that you need to pay for in addition for the cost of the mileage, in uh, addition for the cost of the of the RV. And, and I'll, I'll talk about those in a second. You don't have to have them all, but the packages that we use, one of the things I suggest is that you just have like an all-inclusive package, which builds everything in. It's generally less expensive and it's just more convenient knowing that you have everything provided. But you can just choose some elements if you absolutely definitely know you aren't going to need all of them. So for example, um, there is a mileage cost. So you pay by mileage or you can buy unlimited mileage. And this isn't necessarily separate. So when I would give you a quote from Oto, we would include the things you wanted and that would just come as part of the price. But I'm just kind of explaining to you what bits are optional. So mileage, you pay by the mileage, but you can have an unlimited mileage package and that makes it nice and easy. You don't need a special license to drive these. The, your normal UK license will will be fine. Campsites are booked separately. It's not part of the package that I would book that you the campsites wouldn't come included in that. That's the same with all providers because most campsites are booked locally and directly anyway. And the other thing is that it gives you the more flexibility to be able to kind of book a campsite if you want or not, change your mind and things like that. However, um, I will absolutely help you to put together an itinerary and, and give you ideas of campsites. And we'll talk a bit more about 
what kind of those campsites might look like. So you don't need to feel that, oh, I've got this motorhome and now I don't know what to do with it for 14 days. I will help you put together an itinerary and I've got a good idea of lots of campsites anyway. And there's loads and loads of resources that um, we can tap into in order to get you to somewhere that would be suitable. Something I do want to mention is seat belts. Now, there is a little bit of difference between the Canadian and American models. And one of the main differences is that in the Canadian models of of general higher motorhomes they tend to have three point seat belts in the back the american ones don't and i've looked all over at private hire and at um commercial rentals and they just don't have them so you do need to think about that if you have very small children the only real three point seat belts are in the front and there's two of them and one is the driver so if you have two small children you know you you may want to consider whether you would feel comfortable having one of them sit in the back with a lap belt so that in the there will be enough seat belts for everybody that the the motorhome can take but they will be lap belt in the back so just bear that in mind with the size and age of your child they wouldn't want anyone to turn turn up you know turn up and think um that they were going to have you know three children under five seated in in car seats and things because that probably isn't going to be possible in america maybe possible in canada so just something to bear in mind insurance is included in all rentals with cruise america and with the majority of the cruise rentals that we use the only thing that is well there's two things that aren't included one is a um a waiver for the deductible the what do they call it the excess um you know which you would need to pay you can um we can sort of see if that we can include that or cost that in the price but something we can't cost in the price and you need to pay locally is an environmental tax and that's just about like disposal of um the different fluids they use in the motorhome it's just something they have to do and you have to pay locally i think that's about seven um dollars uh, a night but does vary i think by state so that's just one thing so everything we could include everything but the thing that we couldn't include in terms of um the motorhome would be this environmental tax generators are available in the in the, most of the u.s motorhomes and in the largest motorhome in canada you pay by the hour that you use the generator again this can be included in like an unlimited package you don't need to worry too much about that but generators are not intended to be run for hours and hours and they're not intended to be run overnight they need to be checked and the oil needs to be checked every six hours and there's also a you know a, a with having a generator inside your vehicle you have to think about like see um carbon monoxide and things like that so it's intended if you pull over the side of the road you want to use some of the um electrical points but it's not intended to be run overnight now having said that there is a battery which you can use to to put the lights on so you don't need to kind of sit in the darkness if you don't have mains power but it won't power the microwave the fridge will run on gas the heating runs on gas, but you can't have um, you can't have the microwave or power points if you wanted to plug in your hair dryer or your whatever. So again, just think about whether or not you need electric power every night, um, but you can use the generator in in between. Most places don't let you run the generator overnight anyway, even in free campsites, because they are very noisy. So it's just something to think about. Personal and provision kits. Everyone's like, oh, well, I'm not going to want to carry all my stuff with me. You can hire a kitchen kit, which is everything you would need for the kitchen. And also um, bedding. You can hire a, a kit per person. And that means that you don't have to worry about that when you get when you get there. Or you can just buy something cheap when you're out there. But you obviously need to think about what you're going to do afterwards again all this stuff can be included when i put my motor home to i put all these things generator mileage insurance provision kits personal kits all as part of the rental but it's just things you need to think about um and we're going to talk about um campsites next but while camping camping without being in a campsite is possible and is allowed thinking about what i've said just said about the generator um you just need to bear in mind how long you can go without needing to go to a campsite and we'll talk about that next um just to say again this has been streamed through Streamyard. if you have a comment or you want to say hello please post in the comments i may not necessarily be able to see your name but i will be, will be able to see your comment if you're watching this on replay please leave me a comment or a question happy to answer as best i can okay campsites 
There are a variety of campsites available across North America from free to 60, 70 plus dollars a night. And they will vary in the facilities that they provide. It's exactly the same as in the UK. You will have some places where they just you pay five dollars just to park in a, in a nice car park, essentially, or you will pay 60, 70 dollars, even more than that sometimes to have a campsite which has its own um, cooking area, maybe a barbecue, a like a raised platform that you can use. It might have a dog walk area. There might be swimming pools, kids activities, parks. You know, there is a massive variety. So you may want to mix it up or you may want to stay in particular kinds of campsites. Um, some places like Walmart will, will allow you to park for free in their uh, in their car park. So again, you know, you there's lots of places and lots of options for you to be able to stop. Popular parks and popular dates will require early reservations. We are going to be going to the Grand Canyon and, and I, I need to get my reservation booked quick because we're going in April 2022 and they start booking up a year in advance. So I need to get that in. Otherwise, I'm not going to get in there. So anywhere that's really popular, you need to book early. Lots of them will have um, free cancellation or, you know, reduced fee cancellation if you if you need to cancel up to a certain number of days beforehand. Just know what it is that you're booking. And I just mentioned there a little bit about wild camping, but probably not with a generator overnight. So just be aware of that. So several different kinds of campsites that we're going to stay in. I just wanted to kind of share with you generally what sort of campsites are available. State park campsites are brilliant. So this is in uh, Lost Dutchman State Park. This is an actual camp space, electric and other hookups here. You've got your little... Um, camping table some of them will have like I think there's like a barbecue pit what an incredible place to park in where you have that view and the sunsets in Lost Dutchman State Park are incredible so we just remember to sit in our car park at our parking space and that is going to be our view but we'll have all the facilities that you will need from um from a, a campsite they don't generally have facilities they sometimes have parks they don't generally have pools and washing machines and shops and restaurants and things but they will have you know the, the full hookup that you'll need to be able to camp national parks are the same um, or national park properties this is at lake powell it's a national recreation area you can see the campsites on the left there um, looking down over the lake really beautiful location again similar to the state parks these will book up incredibly fast the national parks are the most popular then you can have privately run resorts that i've alluded to with pools and other things this is just one example of somewhere it's a lot more like a sort of camp uh, caravan park you might sort of see in this country and you can stay there they tend to be more expensive but you you get all the facilities kids love those with the pools and then something they call boondocking which is free wild camping there are many places in america and in canada where you can stay overnight and it's not a problem you need to check this out that are apps and, and websites that I can give you information on about where you can and cannot park. But generally, it is much more widely accepted than it is, example, in this country, where parking on the side of the road or just in a random car park overnight is becoming more and more challenging. So it is really easy to do this in America, but you just need to be careful of how far off the road you go, what kind of clearance you have, you know, how safe it is where you are. What, they, you know, there's no facilities some places are in slightly rocky areas you may have high like buttes above you is there a chance of rock falls you know all the sensible things um and some places which are not technically boondocking but maybe like an open area but it has like a very minimal like five dollar charge to come in they won't be serviced in any way but it'll just be like a protected area for camping um but you know infinite number of places that you can choose to camp overnight Oh, just one thing to say about that is that what you will need is you will need water, which you can put in your um, in your RV when you go to a campsite. And a tank of water will probably last you a day or well, a couple of days, maybe depends how much you use and, and how kind of how whether you have a short shower or a long shower. You'll be able to run the shower and the water on the battery and you'll be able to use gas for heating and things like that. So you'll be able to do some functions you'll be able to do gas cooking on the hob but obviously not be able to plug into electric you may have to use the generator to charge up like mobile phones and things for a short number of um hours 
but also you will need to dump your grey water, which is a sink and um, shower water, and your black water, which is your toilet water, and those tanks will fill up over time. You will need to dump those in a designated facility. You can't just dump them anywhere. So you will need to go to campsites probably every two to three nights minimum in order to refill with water and get rid of your waste. So where can you visit? Um, I did a very detailed itinerary of my Arizona trip, which I explained before, but this is a whiz through of about six or seven different itineraries that you might think about when traveling through North America. These are a tiny fraction of the itineraries you could do. And in fact, you know, the itinerary that I'm doing isn't even one that's on here. And there's a whole, like whole loads of America they've completely missed out. But some of the things that you might think about for example, driving Highway 1 in California, which I'm going to talk about in a bit, really popular. Anything in the southwest here, you can see there's loads and loads and loads of itineraries in this area here. Um, Arizona, Utah, California, Nevada, many, many options there to see some of the fantastic sites of the North America. Route 66, you know, um, a round trip through um, Dallas, sorry, um, through Texas there you know, the kind of whole Nashville, New Orleans, Memphis area, like blues country. Florida's fantastic for RV and there's loads of things to do there. You can dr drive down the whole eastern coast. You can drive down the whole western coast. You can do New England. There's several options in New England, which I think are really lovely. Then you've got this whole section here, which is where you have um, North, to, sort of just just sort of across from South Dakota, you've got loads of national parks, Yellowstone, Grand Tetons, Glacier National Park. Um, talk a little bit about more about that. You've got Salt Lake City and Denver and the whole Rocky Mountains here. There isn't really even a, a, a proper Rocky Mountains one, um, or there is just there. But there's a whole section of Denver, which has been uh, of Colorado, which has been missed out, which has lots of amazing things to see. And then in Canada, you've got like the west and the east, and then you know whole sections in the middle where they haven't got anything, but it's still lots of amazing things to see. Other these primarily are probably the ones you'd want to go on a, on a motorhome trip. So there are thousands of possible itineraries. And this is absolutely one of my favorite things is helping people to do itineraries. So you don't need to worry if you, you know, you don't even know exactly where you want to go, or how long you should go in a day in a day. I am more than happy to help you with that. Cruise America and other places where Cruise America specifically have, you know, detailed itineraries. I'll show you an example of one that I'm going to talk about. You know, it comes with a list of places it gives you suggested campsites so you you don't need to start from scratch you can start to build something and then and tailor it to yourself so i'm just going to run through these few itineraries to give you an idea of the sort of places you could visit and what things you might want to see okay so the first one this is my own itinerary i'm not going to go into it in detail because i've done a whole video on it for an hour but just to say that this is an arizona based itinerary for 14 nights mainly based around um going to national parks and other outdoor activities but also some historical or cultural sites this is a great itinerary families particularly if you want to find out more about it watch my other video i'm just going to show you a few photographs of the things we'd see on this trip to give you an idea of the kind of landscapes so tucson is the home of those very large garo cactuses that dominate the landscape um incredible for photos and very sort of um the, the thing you think of probably when you think of arizona other than the grand canyon which is also on our tour um, and worth a visit if you're in the southwest Horseshoe Bend, another iconic Instagrammable place. Everybody going there at the moment. And another one, Antelope Canyon. Again, really, really popular. And this Antelope Canyon, Horseshoe Bend, and the Grand Canyon feature on quite a few of the Southwest itineraries. I would say if you can fit them in, those are, you know, are three great places to visit. And the final place on my trip that I love is Sedona. And I would encourage anyone who's in that area to go. It's one of my absolute favourite places to visit. It's beautiful. It's really lovely. It's got a really nice feel into it. Um, can't wait to go back there. So that's a very quick skip through. So then the next one is 14 Nights, Utah, Mighty Five and more. So Utah has five um, national parks. Zion National Park, Bryce National Park, Capitol Reef National Park, Canyonlands National Park, and Arches National Park. These are five incredible places to visit and easy to visit on one trip. And they call them the Mighty Five because they are all very distinct, different, and amazing. This trip 
also so start in las vegas which is a great beginning and end into any trip in the southwest if you haven't been to vegas i would highly encourage you to go to it. it's brilliant and it's a really good place to start this trip or you could uh, start this trip in vegas and end in denver start a trip in vegas and end in phoenix those are really popular ways of doing this um if you're going to do a one-way trip as well so start in vegas up through to, to Zion. Zion, I think, is probably my favourite national park. It is, though, very, very busy and very, um, it can get very crowded. So you need to think carefully about how you tour in, in Zion to be able to see it. It's got some incredible hikes. If you are someone who doesn't mind heights, that is not me. You can hike through the Narrows, which is basically a very, very narrow canyon with river in the bottom. And you hike through the actual river. Um, beautiful. Yeah, my my probably my favorite national park then on to um lake powell which i, I mentioned earlier that this page area is something i cover in quite extensive detail in my arizona itinerary and so i would encourage you to go and look at that that's where you'll be able to see antelope canyon horseshoe bend lake powell the colorado river and also down to the grand canyon again covered in my other video you move on to Monument Valley, an absolute must visit. It's not a national park, it's a tribal park. So it's run by the Navajo people. Absolute must do. It, it is exactly how you expect it to look and so much better. The great thing about the um, Monument Valley is you can actually drive down into the valley. You need to be careful. Not all, It's not suitable for all vehicles. And you may need to check whether your RV is suitable. But even if you can't drive, there you can hire a guide and they can drive you right down into the rocks it's you get much more access than you do in the national parks to up close and personal to some of the incredible rock formations um uh, definitely must do you got round to Mesa Verde, Mesa Verde which is um a I can't think of the word a Pueblo um hill cliff I can't think of it Pueblo ancient Pueblo cliff cliff dwellings and um, so built into the rock you know amazing um historical and cultural place to visit up around to, to moab moab is like the heart of um of utah really in terms of places to stay and visit and you can see arches national park um canyon Lands national park there's so many things to see it's a really um, center for off-roading and um outdoor activities you know definitely somewhere you should visit Drive through Capitol Reef National Park, another stunning place to pass through. This whole section here, or a lot of this section here, is um, scenic by Week 12, one of the most picturesque drives in the US. Through to Bryce, which is just, when I, you'll see the picture shortly, somewhere unlike anywhere I've ever seen. Um, yeah, it's just amazing with all the spiky hoodoos down on the valley an incredible site and then back through zion because you can drive through it twice why wouldn't you uh, and then home to vegas the only thing to note if you go through zion is there's a tunnel there um there's two routes to kind of get into the to the park and the tunnel does require you to make a reservation if you if you're in a um, a vehicle which is over a certain height and width because you have to go in the middle of the road and they have to escort you so you do need to prepare about that in in ahead of time but that is what I'm here for, to help you with those things. So let's have a quick look at just some of the photos from places you could visit. You've got Vegas, Zion National Park, my favourite. Uh, it's impossible in one photo to get any sense of what these places look like because you could take 100 photos and still not really truly understand quite how beautiful they are. Monument Valley, as I said, iconic, absolute must visit. Arches National Park, this is Delica Arch, this is one of the most iconic pictures you can take in Utah. It's not that easy to get to. Um, it's actually featured on their kind of, it's like their state symbol. But yeah, you know, most people will recognise that. Bryce, as I alluded to, just again, there are, you could take any number of photos from Bryce, from in the canyon, from above the canyon, from every different lookout and get and see something different. But it is phenomenal. So we're talking about California next. 
another really popular itinerary, particularly including Highway 1. Everyone wants to drive from San Francisco to, to Los Angeles or the other way um, and go down that coastal road. And I have done it and I would highly, highly recommend it. So this is based on a 10 night itinerary. I don't think that's enough. I would make this 14 nights absolutely. But, you know, this is the one that Cruise America put together. And I just kind of stole that to give you a, a, an idea. This is um, Los Angeles, starting in Los Angeles and heading at the coast road to San Francisco. Go. I'd probably be tempted to do it the other way around because you're on the right hand side of the road, which gives you kind of the undisturbed views. But you know, it's a much of a muchness, really. You could do it, you could do it the other way around. So for the sake of this of this trip, going from Los Angeles and then driving up that road through Monterey, Carmel, Big Sur, stopping at Hearst Castle, which is a really popular that is described here as a um a folly. Uh, a folly built by the newspaper billionaire William Randolph Hearst. You can go and visit that. Then you get to stay in San Francisco. Now, there is an argument to start this trip in San Francisco because you could just stay in the city, which I probably would recommend rather than necessarily staying in a campsite. But there are campsites where you can take the local transportation into the city. And so it is possible to kind of camp in San Francisco and visit places. There's loads to see in that area as well. You could even go up further. You know, there's so much more in, in Northern California, but we're not even going to have time to, to, to go through that today. Um, then coming round through to Yosemite, another absolute must. Um, you, the Yosemite Valley is, again, something that just takes your breath away, especially when you're in the bottom of the valley looking up. You can't quite get a grip on how big Half Dome, for example, is. It's really yeah, it's really impressive. So definitely would you would want to visit there. I would argue you probably want to stay at least two nights there. But um, with a lot of these Cruise America itineraries, they tend to whiz people through because they know people don't have a massive amount of time. But I would say, you know, perhaps that's somewhere you would spend longer. Coming down through Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park, that's where you can see General Sherman, the largest um, living thing in the world. He's a, a Sequoia tree. Um, I've been to see him. He's huge. Uh you know, what, why wouldn't you want to go and see it? Pass by Death Valley, not necessarily that easy to visit on this route, but you probably could make a detour because there's certain ways you have to um, get in. But yeah, another place to visit. I haven't been, um, but I, it's definitely somewhere I want to go because it's, you know, very hot and it's it kind of really far below sea level, which I just think is weird. But yeah, that's somewhere else to visit. Down through Barstow, which is on Route 66, and into San Diego, which is one of my other favourite cities in the UK and the US. Um, I really like it there. It's got a really nice vibe, quite sort of multicultural isn't quite the word, but there's a lot of a Mexican influence, great and Mexican food, really laid back, sort of seaside, but in a cool way. Um, yeah, love San Diego and then back up to Los Angeles, which I'm not going to talk about because, quite frankly, I don't really like it. <laughs> I'm sure that's a bit unfair. I'm sure there are lots of lovely things to do in Los Angeles, but it isn't necessarily my favorite place to visit in the US. OK, so we're just going to run through just some quick pictures for you to have an idea of what I've been talking about. Los Angeles there, which everyone's familiar with. This is Big Sur. That bridge is really, really popular, although I think it's currently under renovation, but I'm sure it'll be finished soon. Monterey, again, really popular. San Francisco, of course, iconic. Great city, uh, fabulous city. For You could spend at least three, four days there. Yosemite National Park, one of the best, one of the very best. And then San Diego. And one thing I didn't say about San Diego is that the Balboa Park, which is enormous, is a really fantastic place to visit in the city and it's got the world's largest outdoor pump organ if you're interested in that. Okay, so Florida. Another trip I I mean this isn't just this isn't just a list of trips that Emma's done, although <laughs> though some of it is. I've done part of this trip. Um I think Florida is a brilliant RV destination. Florida gets overlooked for holidays that it's not Orlando because people don't think about other things to do in Florida, but they don't so many things to do in Florida that aren't to do with theme parks. It has great year round weather. There's loads of places to visit. There's loads of national parks, state parks. It's right on the water. You know, there's, there's water sports and activities left, right and center. There's so many things you can see in Florida that I would absolutely recommend you go on a non, um, a non sort of theme park trip. 
theme parks are good too but you know in in addition to that um and one of my favorite things to do is to go down to the florida keys that probably one of my favorite holidays ever this trip starts in miami and you spend a couple of days driving down the keys key west is really interesting unusual place really kind of very accepting vibe really like anything's possible the weather's lovely it's only 90 miles from cuba it is always nice there pretty much for the whole year so you can get really great weather even in the even in the winter um the drive is beautiful it's iconic i can't say any i don't know how many more adjectives to use and then you come back up through key largo at the john penn camp coral reef state park where you can see amazing fish life we took took a glass bottom boat and i became very seasick so um just just be aware of that but lovely things to see there too go through everglades which is is not a swampland apparently i was reading today it's actually a very slow moving slow moving river but you can do all the fun things there crocodiles alligators um you can do the airboats skimming along like as if you're in um csi miami which is probably an old reference now but i used to i used to love watching that there's yeah the everglades is is definitely a fun place to go for, for adults and kids um you come along this sort of west coast and there's beautiful beaches the gulf the gulf coast beaches are lovely through so tampa bay this trip does include a stop in orlando for one night i'm not sure there's any much point in that either do your orlando holiday and add this on as an extra or you know do it separately like one one night one night in in um in disney unless you know you really just want to just want to drop in and um, it's probably not enough for anybody round to cape canaveral which is where the candy space center is another fantastic fascinating place to visit for adults and children you know one day isn't enough like there's so much to do and see there you can see rockets you can see what does it say here launch areas you can see the world's largest building or the building like one story building um where they always might be the second largest now i think the actual largest is on the west coast but um a very one of the very largest buildings in the world where they store the rockets when they're kind of built uh, and you could and i driven past, we drove past it and i couldn't kind of get my head around the fact how big it actually was um it because it just there's no context but yeah amazing amazing to see and then come down so through sort of like boca raccoon and that um east coast beaches juno palm beach um you know really nice kind of florida lifestyle you know surfing and being on the beach and being seen and you know all the all the things uh that people love to do on that kind of florida coast area and then back to miami which itself is an interesting city and definitely worth a visit so like a real whistle top stop tour again nine nights nowhere near enough you could do 40 no problem miami and south beach there looking lovely florida keys i mean i don't know whether this photo is photoshopped or not but it's that that's what it's like it's just the color of the water is phenomenal um and the bridges that go between you just kind of feel like you're flying over the water especially in an rv you'd be sitting a bit up a bit higher it'd be amazing uh key largo there the state park with all the fish we saw quite a few turtles as well it's quite a lot of turtles in um, florida we saw saw them in a few different occasions and we saw them in the everglades tampa bay the tampa bay bridge well, it does have a name, which is, that isn't its name, actual name. Um, but it's quite iconic, and you can drive over that. And then uh, Juno Beach. So moving on to the northwest. Um, <clears throat> I haven't done this trip. I have done some of it, not all of it. Um, but again, you know, when I'm looking at this trip, I'm thinking, oh, but they forgot this, and they haven't added on this, and this bit is an amazing bit that we could we could see. This is a twelve night trip, nowhere near enough needs to be at least 14 nights you could even do three weeks and not even cover the not even like scratch the surface nowhere near enough but as an i as a, as a as a round trip it's a great idea seattle's a fabulous place to fly into because you can fly in direct from the uk whereas some of the places in the sort of northwest area don't necessarily have direct flights in the uk the next nearest one is denver and there's quite a big gap between there so places like salt Lake city which would be ideal for this type of trip um you can't fly in direct but seattle's great and seattle is also um a brilliant city S such a cool city loads to do one of the best days i think we've ever had on holiday was the day the whole day we spent in seattle they've got underground um 
so part of the city was built on top of a, of the old town old city and so underground they've got um, old shops and things that you can go and see which is cool and of course you've got the space needle uh, which you know, gives you incredible views this route takes you through the north cascades national park which most people have never heard of but is really stunning um mountain landscape in the north part of of usa definitely worth a visit what isn't on this itinerary sort of in this area here is glacier national park which actually goes into canada it's the only national park that splits across the border um i think if you're missing that out you're missing a trick you know that is really impressive um place to place to visit again i, I put it on the pictures just because it's so beautiful and animals particularly this you know this route if you're looking for bear bison elk eagles you know all those kinds of animals you'll see on this itinerary brings you through to bozeman which is quite a cool little little town into yellowstone national park they've given you one night in yellowstone i would say you probably need three nights in yellowstone maybe four nights in yellowstone yellowstone has a ring road just 100 miles long and that road is continuously um blocked by bison elk bear so you know even getting around is you know can take forever because you want to stop and see things and even though people think oh i go to yellowstone i'll see old faithful move on that is one tiny part of the park it's actually sections of the park which which are totally um different to those geezer pools that's just one small section there's so much else to see in yellowstone um you know definitely need a few days there Come, kind of coming back round by the snake river and through boise um and through to um portland oregon which and i was reading this earlier what did how do you describe portland as uh, it said it's the best big city the, yeah it was voted the best big city in in the usa a, a really popular city a cool vibe um i keep saying that all the time cool vibe all of them got cool vibes but the portland portland is um really popular city to, for people to visit and then you come up to, back into washington state and pass mount st helens which is not a national park but you'll probably recognize it because it um it's a, a volcano of, and it exploded not that long ago. And then you come through to Mount Rainier National Park, which I have been to and is also another active volcano. It's really lovely, you know, the, the I don't think I've got a photo of it, but the, the, the peak of the mountain covered in snow with beautiful wildflower flower meadows um, is a lovely contrast there. And then back through to Seattle, which again, you could probably spend three or four days at. What isn't on here is, um, the sort of northwest of of washington state where olympic national park is and i think that is worth a visit too so another thing you could add on you could add on about 20 things to this journey and make it about six months long so it's a quick a quick whiz through this oh that's why i didn't include it because mount radio is there in the background of seattle you can see it from lots of parts of seattle and it looks like it's been photoshopped that is that is what it's like it depends depends where you are in seattle and sometimes you're driving along you can see it in the distance and you're like trying to get a photo of it and then you'll go a bit high and you won't be able to see, you won't be able to see it um this is north cascades national park the color of that water just amazing um and then glacier national park similar that kind of like deep blue water very rugged um tree lined similar similar environment um yosemite I did put in the classic geyser pool, but it is nowhere near the only things to see there. Again, you could take 100 photos from Yosemite and not even know you were necessarily even in the same park. And Portland there, nice, pretty city. Uh, and then on to Canada. So just looking at two itineraries in Canada, one on the east and one on the west. This eastern coast is is really interesting i think nova scotia new brunswick prince edward island these places are very evocative of um that sort of um quite kitsch with the lighthouses and a lovely coastline and i just thought this was a big contrast to some of the things you see in other parts of um, the usa and uh, canada although probably um new england would have a similar sort of vibe um so yeah you start here in oh thanks my phone's telling me i'm great um <laughs> 
So you start in Halifax, which um, one of the good things about Halifax, or interesting things about Halifax, is it's got um, the Museum of the Atlantic, which has artifacts from the Titanic in, because of course, this part of Canada was where um, people went to after the Titanic crashed. And then you're gonna go around to um, a few different national parks. I'm not even gonna attempt to pronounce this, but we're talking about apparently this national park has the largest collection of petroglyphs in North America, which if you don't know that is, that's ancient um, Native American drawings. So that's interesting to see. Then you drive across the bridge, um, across the Bay of Fundy. This is a really interesting place to visit. If you've never seen this, um, Bay of Fundy yes, has the largest tidal range in the world, 48 feet twice a day. And although in, in South Wales, we have the second largest tidal range of the Bristol Channel does. Um, it's still an impressive thing. It's you know it's still significantly greater, but also they have really unusual rock formations as a result of that, just because of the the geology they have there versus the geology we have here. So definitely somewhere to see. But also this whole bay is brilliant for um, whales. So I'm just um, looking at my notes. It's a mating ground for finback, humpback, minke, and right whales. So if you're at the, the right season, you should be able to see whales. So um, that's another impressive reason to go there. And then coming back around is another national park there, um, which again is makes it difficult for me to pronounce. Um, I'm not even going to try. But take it to Princess Prince Edward Island, which has loads of um, lighthouses. I think they've got 50, light, 50 plus lighthouses there. So something really cool for you to see. And also um, then sort of following back around here and then take you to the eye, uh, coastal town of Inverness, which its coastal waters are known for mermaid tears, which I didn't even know what they were till I researched this. It's little tiny, little tiny coloured glass. So they like like rocks, but they're like tiny little pieces of glass. And apparently you can see that along this area too. So there's loads to see there. We'll have a little look at some photos just for you to get an idea. Peggy's Lighthouse is a popular place for people to visit. The Cochin, Cochi, it is written down here somewhere. I'm going to try and pronounce it. Cochibuguac National Park um, is, you know, kind of a foresty national park with um, like marshes, tidal rivers. So unusual animal habitats for you to be able to see birds and things like that there. The Bay of Fundy, like I said, you know, this is essentially the ocean floor, which gets flooded twice a day. And it's unlike our beaches, which just kind of go out flat. You've got these incredible rock formations, which make it stand out. And again, Prince Edward Island with uh, these unusual rock formations and all its lighthouses. And then the final one is the Canadian Rockies. So probably not dissimilar to the to the North American, uh, the, sorry, the American Rockies one we were doing, but uh, other, you know, if you if you wanted to stay in Canada, you can have a similar sort of experience. Starting in Vancouver, um, through to ok Okanagan Lake, round to Lake Louise and Bam. From when I show you the pictures, you'll definitely rec recognize that. You can do this out of Calgary too, so you could do. Um, one way from Calgary and do half of this. You could do a round trip from Calgary through to Jasper. Again, Jasper National Park, Banff National Park, very um, rugged mountains, you know, the glacier lakes, animal, you know, wildlife watching, bears, elk, deer, all those sorts of things. Um, and back down to Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver is a brilliant place to stay. You could probably spend three, four nights there. Vancouver Island is a, is, it's sort of another section off where you've got Victoria. There's loads of water sports there. Again, another pl brilliant place to see whales. You've got a lot of um, uh, orcas and those other kinds of, of marine wildlife. But this would also be something if you wanted to twin this with an Alaskan cruise, you can cruise out of Vancouver. You can also cruise out of Seattle, but I think probably that itinerary plus a, a cruise, you'd be away for a month. But you could do, you know, you could do a Calgary itinerary for say seven nights up through here, drop a motor home off, a couple of days in Vancouver, and then um, go on a, an Alaskan cruise. What an amazing trip that would be. So let's have a look. Banff, as I said, you probably will recognize these photos really iconic like that's Lake Louise um Jasper the same you know just and and probably less busy than the American parks as a elk there 
and Vancouver, a really lovely city, really popular with families, lots to do. So I think that's the end of what I was going to talk about. I hope that's given you a really good thorough understanding of what Moktoman is like and what sort of itineraries you could use. Now, obviously, and as I said in my previous video, these itineraries, you don't have to use them just for Moktoman. And if you want access to any of these itineraries, I can send them to you because I um, have them on PDF and I can just send you one rather than you trying to search for them because some of them, some of them have very weird names which might not necessarily give you the one that you're looking for. So I can send them to you. Um, you could do them as, as um, normal road trips, but I think they really work well as motorhome trips because of the places there are to stay, of the number of stops there are, which makes it easier when you're using a motorhome. So I, I, if you have any questions that I haven't covered, please chat with me. If you think, yes, this is brilliant, I really want to book this now, we, you know, we can probably book motorhomes till at least the end of 2022, depending on where, where, where we can get, it depends on the flights, whether or not we can get flights that are out of date range. The supplier that I generally use to this, you know, a lot of the deposits start at £99 a person. So really low risk, very low deposit to be able to kind of put, you know, your name down for, for a fabulous trip like this. And some of the logistics we can work out later on if that's, you know, it feels overwhelming to kind of make too many decisions now. You can just kind of book the flights and the motorhome and then we can arrange an itinerary as suits you. I am more than happy to help you with that. It's absolutely one of my favourite things to do. So I hope that was useful. And yeah, any questions, let me know. Thank you very much for watching.